I know how dangerous it is over there. This is Iraq, and the last time I remember Iraq, we were getting blown up a lot. So it's probably even more fucked up now. So do I really want to go and risk getting killed? You know, but I thought about why am I there anyway? You know, what? why did I join in the first place? And how, will, how much will I let down these guys if I sit this one out? Duty is above the letter of the law. It's a way of calibrating what you want to do with what you're responsible for and matching all of that up against how you see yourself as a person. Joe Alato had wanted to be in the military since he was a little boy. Having become a soldier, he knew his duty primarily was to hold himself accountable to the expectations his fellow soldiers had of him and the expectations he had of himself. When you're a soldier though, Sometimes you have to bet your life that what you're doing is the right thing and that your comrades are as well. You're walking down the road one second and the next second you're hitting the chest with a sledgehammer and you're on the ground. And I'm completely conscious and lucid for all of this. I see, smell, hear, feel everything that's going on around me. And I'm walking in the next instant, I'm looking up into the sky and I knew that something bad had happened. I knew that I was hit. And my first thoughts are that I'm dying. You know, I'm, I'm laying on the ground looking up into the sky and, and I'm dying, right? I feel like I'm dying. I feel like I've been shot. It felt like I was shot in the chest. So I have mere seconds left of life and I'm spending it looking up into the sky. Often, we have this false sense of control. If we do our jobs, follow the right steps, we'll have a good outcome. From the word go, Joe Alato lived up to his expectations. He took on his fourth deployment with an eye toward helping the new guys protect themselves. He showed them precisely how he had gotten through his multiple combat tours as an MP, mostly unscathed. But when you're looking down at your own blood-soaked uniform, you're not thinking about teachable moments or how well you followed protocol. You are just wondering what your last thought will be and when it will come. What is true bravery? What makes a hero a hero? Tested by the worries of what's happening at home, thousands of miles away, and the reality of what you're facing here and now. When your life is in danger every second, and it's either kill or be killed. From Wondery and Incongruity Media, this is Anthony Russo, and this is war. When you live in the Washington, D.C. area, there's nothing like a day trip to the Capitol. Growing up, Joe went often. His mom would take him to the mall, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, and the Lincoln Memorial. It is hard to overstate the power these places hold on the American psyche. It's tough not to be moved by the history of struggle, valor, and sacrifice enshrined in the Washington, D.C. monuments. For Joe Alato, the weight of history coupled with those day trips solidified his path into the American military more than any attempt at recruitment could have. I remember seeing Rolling Thunder come in every year and seeing all the Vietnam veterans, um, and I was always impressed by them. And I always had a lot of uh, respect towards those guys and, and uh, what those memorials and monuments represented. You know, tying that in, reading about these guys and what they went through in their history and their experiences and then seeing, you know, represented in front of me via, you know, these memorials in D.C., uh, it just struck a chord, you know, and I wanted to be a soldier since I was little. Well, I was, you know, soldier and sailor and Marine and this and that and the other thing. But the idea of serving in the military and the idea of service was always at the core of what I wanted to do. Since I was little, I had this just energy. I don't know. I don't know how to put an energy, a fire or something just propelling me forward where just I want to do a lot of things. I want to have a lot of experiences. I want to, you know, I want to have a life of adventure. I want to see the world. I just want to learn everything that I can and see what's out there. I didn't want to follow the expected timeline, you know, go to college, get a career, buy a house, you know, start a family, that sort of thing. It wasn't interesting to me at all. I, I wanted to do my own thing. And I looked around me and I saw people living in that flow and I had no desire to be part of it. By the time Joe was a junior in high school, joining the Army was a foregone conclusion. And as he entered his senior year, with his parents' help and permission, 
he enlisted through the delayed entry program. Joe was from Montgomery County, Maryland. It's a well-to-do suburb where plans to go to college are kind of expected. A couple of kids from his senior class entered the military, but certainly it wasn't the norm. Still, the suburbs have their own kind of suffocation, and Joe was sensitive to it. Not going into the services wasn't really ever a consideration for Joe. Although he hadn't done much in the way of making A's in school, he had a pretty good understanding of military history. He read widely about the military, so much so that it was more a concept for him than anything else. Plus, in the fall of 2000, when he enlisted, there wasn't much pressure about deployment. Being in the Army meant something else altogether. Joe was signing up for travel and adventure. He hadn't really considered what he would do day to day once he was in the Army. But I didn't really understand how many jobs there were in the Army, how many options you had. And the recruiter told me, you know, if you're in the MP Corps, if you serve as a military police soldier, there are different military police units. You have garrison units. Garrison units are in military police cars. They drive around on post and they act as police officers. And then you have the tactical side of the combat side, the combat MPs. And as an MP in a tactical unit, you could be assigned to do a number of things. You might be QRF, which is quick reaction force. So if you're deployed to a combat zone, you would be called up to respond to another unit who is under attack. Or you could be doing route recon, route security. So I liked the idea that there were options. I didn't know quite what I wanted to be, but I wanted to have a choice, more or less. And I also wanted to be airborne. So I demanded that if they take me, that they put airborne in my contract. So I got that. If there's fighting to be done... The airborne units usually find their way into the mix. But that wasn't Joe's motivation. His desire to add airborne was much less nuanced. He was afraid of heights and figured the best way to conquer that fear was to be tossed out of an airplane. And eventually it came to just that. But long before he left for basic training, the summer of 2001 found Joe doing menial labor for a tree company. He wanted a punishing summer job that would help get him stronger and a little bit more rugged in preparation for basic training. Joe was set to leave for the Army on September 24, 2001. It's one of those things that happens where everybody knows where they were and what they were doing. And I actually happened to be at work. We were in the middle of nowhere in the big field behind a house cutting some trees down. And it came out on the radio, so I didn't have the visual to go along with the audio, but we did listen to the, you know, the the commentary as the towers were hitting as they went down and the realization that it was a terrorist attack. I don't remember what kind of an effect it had on me, and you know, that's really weird to say because you think somebody waiting to go to the army, it would affect them deeply. You know, (laughs) this complete shift in what's going on in the world and the fact that we very likely may be going to war. Um, And I don't remember having any of these, any of these, uh, uh, you know, reflecting on that. Sweet spot might not be the right word, but Joe certainly fell into a very particular cadre of enlistees. He had always planned on going into the army and had accepted that fighting might be part of that. But if you remember the world in the week following the September 11th attacks, there wasn't much talk of a ground troops war. There was a national understanding that retaliation was at hand, but it didn't go much further than that. Even though he had fewer than two weeks before heading out into basic training, or maybe because of it, Joe didn't see the attacks from the perspective of a service member. He saw them from the perspective of an 18-year-old kid. Sure, there was anger and disbelief, but it wasn't materially different from the way many of us responded in the weeks following the attacks. By the time any talk of retaliation was starting to bubble up, Joe Alato was in the media blackout that always accompanies basic training. So when news of the war in Afghanistan came, it was sudden and brief and received in a way that demonstrated how committed to action and adventure these new troops were. We're in formation in Fort Leonard Wood. We're in the middle of basic training. And, you know, during morning formation, one of the drill sergeants announces, hey, we've started bombing targets in Afghanistan. We're at war with Afghanistan. You know, um, to be frank, we're all excited. We're children. We're all more or less teenagers. You know, because when you're a kid, you don't really understand what what does, you know, what does war entail and what what are the experiences that you might have and what are your risks? You're you're a kid and you're invincible. It's not going to happen to you. You're going to be the guy 
you know, doing the fighting, not like not someone that gets killed. So, um, from what I can recall, we're all pretty excited that we're at war in Afghanistan. We're all hoping that we get to go to a unit that goes to Afghanistan so we could fight in Afghanistan and go shoot some terrorists in the face. You know, that's what everybody wanted to do. The completely unexpected taste of war shook the military in ways that weren't fully clear at the time. For example, when Joe went to AIT, Advanced Individual Training, to learn how to be an MP, the focus was on garrison policing, with little exposure to the tactical part of the job. In retrospect, it made sense. Even though there were a number of hotspots internationally, the bulk of MPs were being assigned to help run military posts. Combat and tactical missions were rare, and it was better use of the time and resources to gear MP training courses around the jobs MPs had been doing at the time. Joe would get his first combat training in the field, but he wasn't headed for Afghanistan. Instead, he was sent to Kosovo, where he learned peacekeeping patrol duties and got to see firsthand what the aftermath of a long, vicious war could look like. I remember, I guess one of my most vivid memories of Kosovo and kind of what encapsulated kind of that deployment and what had happened beforehand was doing a foot patrol through a ghost town or a ghost village so to speak so um it was a, a village that had been emptied during the war and if you read history of the conflict there it's safe to assume that the village was emptied and everybody was rounded up and taken into the woods and executed because that's what they did it was a genocide you know i believe they were uh it was a muslim town it was a Muslim town and the Serbs had rounded everybody up. I don't re really remember what had happened, but that was kind of haunting to walk through this ghost town. One that was obviously vacated very rapidly. Everybody's living, everybody's, everybody's stuff was still there. Nobody had packed for anything. You know, everybody's stuff is strewn through that whole village. Uh, and you're just walking door to door and walking through this place that, you know, used to have life and it was completely empty. So it was, that left an impression on me for sure. It was 2002, and the second guessing about how Afghanistan should be handled already had started in the press and in political discussion in the U.S. President Bush had named Iraq as part of the axis of evil in his State of the Union address and, in retrospect, cast that country preemptively as a villain. In Kosovo, though, Joe is experiencing inaction firsthand, a country with hatred so deep that there were no signs of healing. Joe was patrolling every day as a reminder that coalition forces were there to prevent attacks or reprisals, but realistically, there was nothing to be done in Kosovo except learn the lessons of it. So Joe took to reading about the conflict, learning about the people and the politics. He decided that he wanted to be more than just a tourist and became a student. Rumors about Iraq had started bubbling up as his deployment came to an end, and Joe, along with the others in his unit, was chomping at the bit to get their first taste of the war. If there was to be an invasion, Joe wanted in, and, with a little finagling, he got what he wanted. Actually, our unit was not slated to go to Kuwait, but part of our unit was, and some of us begged to go. We volunteered. We really wanted to go. Please assign us to this company. We want to go to Kuwait. We want to go to Iraq. And I was one of those people just begging to deploy. And I got a slot. I eventually did get a slot. A couple of us did. One of my good buddies also got a slot. Um, and we were actually assigned to the personal security detail for the battalion leadership. So that's how I got my slot. That's how I got into Kuwait. And that's how I got into Iraq. As a student of history, Joe had a sense of what a buildup would look like. Intellectually, he knew that invasion buildups were massive. But in the months in Kuwait, waiting for the war to begin, those descriptions came to life in a way that still awes him today. The sheer size and scope of the invasion force, even against the sheer size and scope of the desert that surrounded them, was really something to behold. Supplies and Humvees and helicopters and weapons and everything, you know, and artillery, everything you're seeing, you're seeing in numbers you didn't think could exist. And I remember being in Kuwait in this desert in southern Iraq, it's completely flat. From horizon to horizon, the desert is flat. There's not even a pebble you can see. So with that, you can look, if you're in a convoy, you could look as far ahead as the horizon and you see a line of trucks. And then you could look behind you and as far as the horizon, you could see a line of trucks. 
and you have you know squadrons or whatever of helicopters flying overhead that number in you know I don't even know it could, could have been 50 helicopters at a time flying over the, the numbers are just it's ridiculous it's absolutely massive as a, a young man as a kid seeing this it's just overwhelming you know you're part of something that's just immense and historic um, and I remember that more than anything of any other aspect of Kuwait before the invasion I remember that immensity and then it was on you know the push was on and it was all about moving and not stopping don't stop keep moving no matter what. As Joe and the rest of the army filed toward Baghdad, they did so with more confidence than apprehension. This was an overwhelming force of the most highly trained, technologically advanced fighters the world had ever seen. Ahead in the distance, the bombing continued. And as Joe and the rest of his unit trekked across the desert, they were being met by surrendering crowds, and they saw the destruction wrought by the forward troops and the burned-out relics of Operation Desert Storm. And it was hard not to feel confident, and even a little touristy. It was clear that this, too, was going to be a relatively short war. The mission for the support troops was to get to Baghdad as quickly as possible and begin the rebuilding effort. And at first... That is precisely what happened. You'd be hard-pressed to find someone who's more easily trained than a United States military veteran, but finding the right candidate for the right job still can be a real chore. But there has to be something better than just posting your job online and praying for the right people to see it. ZipRecruiter knew there was a smarter way, so they built a platform that finds the right job candidates for you. ZipRecruiter learns what you're looking for, identifies people with the right experience, and invites them to apply to your job. These invitations have revolutionized how you find your next hire. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. And ZipRecruiter doesn't stop there. They even spotlight the strongest applications you receive so you never miss a great match. The right candidates are out there, and ZipRecruiter is how you find them. Businesses of all sizes trust ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. Right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash this is war. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash this is war. ZipRecruiter.com slash this is war. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. I want to tell you a story about Bomba's socks. You know when you put on a quality piece of clothing and can tell right away? That was my experience with Bomba's. They have a weight and a texture that lets you know exactly what they're going to feel like before you even put them on. And that's cool, but it's not the coolest part. For me, the coolest part is the honeycomb arch support. You know when you get your feet rubbed and someone squeezes right around the arch? It's like that, but gently and all day. They genuinely make my feet feel better. They're nice and thick, but they don't suffocate your feet or make them feel hot. Bombas was founded with the mission to donate socks to people in need. Because you can't donate used socks, socks are the most requested item at homeless shelters. The folks at Bombas knew the only way to support their mission was by selling a lot of socks. So instead of going super cheap, they went high quality, and it paid off. So far, Bombas has donated more than a million socks, and they're just getting started. They sent me a pair of socks called Americanos, which are ankle socks that are just a half step below slippers comfort-wise. But even better than that, the ankle socks and the no-show socks have little grips on the heel to keep them from sliding. The calf socks have durable elastic, so they won't sag. The point is, all Bomba socks are designed to stay on your feet and feel new and fresh for a very long time. For every pair of Bomba socks you buy, Bombas donates one pair to someone in need. And if you purchase the Americano socks specifically, they will donate a pair to a homeless vet through their partnership with the VA. It's super cool that they're doing this, especially since the socks are worth it on their own. You can check out the Americano socks by following the link at the top of the page at bombas.com slash this is war. You also can save 20% by visiting bombas.com slash this is war. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash this is war and entering the offer this is war at the checkout code space. It's 
hard to remember how quickly we, as a country, expected the war in Iraq to end. Desert Storm had been similar. On balance, the worry about the war ended up not matching up with the war itself, and, from the outset, it appeared that theory would hold as well. Once they got to Baghdad, they settled in and began the mission. For the MPs, this included training the police and doing presence patrols, and keeping a peace with an eye on future stability. But, as Joe learned pretty quickly, that just wasn't in the cards. Somebody disbands the Iraqi army and bans Ba'athists from serving in government. And that's when the insurgency started. There are a bunch of out-of-work people who are pretty angry at America. Um, and I remember the insurgency started. It was, uh, it took, well, it took me by surprise, because again, I'm a private, not very well informed. But there was a interlude between conventional fighting and the insurgency. There was a quiet time where, you know, Maybe we're going home in a month or two. Maybe we'll be home by Christmas. Maybe we'll be home soon. You know, the war's over. They don't need all of us here. We're all going to go home. And that was the expectation for everybody. All the hard work was done. Maybe it was a week. Maybe it was a two weeks. I don't know. Uh, but then you started to hear some more shooting in Baghdad. You know, you started to hear some more combat, some fighting. And then some explosions. So there's fighting that's starting. In the beginning, they were called roadside bombs. IEDs hadn't been a common term since Vietnam, although it would be back in usage soon enough. The earliest roadside bombs Joe encountered were anti-personnel and anti-tank mines that had been repurposed. While it's perfectly likely that the command knew what they were, the guys on patrol had to learn about them the hard way. Over the course of a year of combat, it was something that every member of the U.S. military would become familiar with if they were deployed in Iraq. And the first time you're blown up, as they call it, it is a terrible shock. But imagine not even knowing there were such things around until there's an explosion with enough force to disable a tank. Is there a good way to respond? Well, you actually have a, a couple of seconds before you know whether you're dead or not. <laughs> You have to get past that part. You have to get past the part of wondering whether you're even alive before you need to worry about whether there's fighting to be done. We didn't know what they were. In fact, everybody was pretty confused about it. Uh, we just knew that sometimes when you're driving down the road, stuff explodes um, and it's bad, right? So we were driving back one evening and uh, a roadside bomb went off in between two of our Humvees. And it was absolutely terrifying because you're not expecting it and you're kind of lax at this point because, you know, the war is over. Um, the insurgency has just started. Uh, so it was absolutely, it was terrifying. And I'm outside of the Humvee, half of me anyway is outside of the Humvee. So I got the full, I got the full experience. Um, and I remember uh, it was my first time and I had the shakes pretty bad my first time. I remember getting back to base and maybe going through a half a carton of cigarettes. I had my buddy there with me um, and I was just shaking, just really shaking. Yeah, my first time. I felt like I was there for a few hours, just with the shakes, getting over it, smoking through cigarettes, trying to calm down. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're, I was completely emotionally unprepared for it. Joe had been trained as a garrison MP. When he got to Kosovo, he kind of learned the ropes about how to be a tactical MP. But he didn't have any practical experience, especially as a gunner, and especially in an IED-driven war when he got to Iraq. But if the army prepares you for anything, it prepares you to adapt. Balancing your preparedness with a perfectly healthy sense of self-preservation, though, can get exhausting. And by the end of his first tour in Iraq, Joe was exhausted and frustrated. MPs have a defensive posture. That is, they don't go out looking for trouble. And even when it finds them, they have very specific rules of engagement. But when you're looking down from your gun turret at a crowd of people after an IED attack, and you know the perpetrator is in the crowd, it can be really difficult not to pull the trigger. There was no rhyme or reason to it, not at my level. Uh, there was just an ebb and flow. Each neighborhood was different, and it's a war fought by neighborhoods. You're in one neighborhood that's pro-American. You could walk around with your helmet off and hang out with the kids and give them candy and have a good time, and you were going to be fine. But you could walk literally across the street, two streets over, and you were in a bad neighborhood. And you needed to be on constant guard because there was a high likelihood that you were going to get hit by something, by someone. You know, you hear you're going to a certain neighborhood, you're like, ah, shit, here we go. We're going to get fucked up today for sure. 
we're going to Abu Ghraib. You know, we're going to get definitely going to get fucked up today. They're using IEDs and then not attacking afterwards. You have absolutely nothing to shoot at. The guy who set off the IED is some guy in the crowd with a cell phone or, or whatever, you know? So you don't know who the enemy is and you're just not going to start shooting everybody around you because one of them is the enemy. You can't do anything. Um, and that's incredibly frustrating and it weighs on you. And speaking personally, that is what weighed on me during this deployment was the frustration and the anger of attack after attack after attack and people getting wounded and people getting killed and you just don't see the enemy. You can't engage with the enemy. You have this weapon in front of you and you can't shoot it at anybody. And you just want to shoot a couple of guys because they've been blowing you up. And that's what weighs on you, you know, for a year long, year plus deployment is, is that everyday struggle of, of being a target but not having a target. The MPs only were able to engage the enemy a few times during their year-long deployment, but not with any satisfaction. On one occasion, they opened fire on an armed man in a marketplace. The target managed to escape, but either Joe or the other gunner hit a civilian woman in the crossfire. The local was unheard. It wasn't much more than a scratch, but even worse was the sense of unfinished business. Frustration and the ebb and flow of peril and boredom all conspired to lengthen the year. And as his first tour came to a close, Joe's sense of mission and self-preservation began feeling a little meaningless. There would be days where you would be leaving the wire and you would feel nothing. Absolutely nothing. No fear. No excitement, no sadness, no happy, nothing. It would just be, you'd be shut down inside. You didn't care if you were going to see combat that day. You didn't care if you were going to die that day. You didn't care if you had to kill anybody that day. There was nothing going on. And I remember rolling outside the wire and having those emotions and actually going into combat and being shot at um, or being RPG'd or something. I think small arms fire happened a couple times when I had that mentality. And I don't even think my pulse raised during those times. Like There was nothing. I didn't care. Okay, get up, stand up. Shift your weapon, point towards where the enemy might be, look to acquire a target, take your weapon off safe, start scanning. You know, do it all automatically, do what you gotta do, and it's like, it's like doing your laundry. But then there would be other days where you'd wake up and you couldn't stop shaking, you would be absolutely terrified. Today's the day that I'm gonna get killed. I'm gonna get gooified by an anti-tank mine. I'm gonna get blown apart, I'm gonna get shot in the face, you know? You, you leave the wire and you're absolutely terrified and you know that's the day you get killed and then nothing happens. You spend the whole day shaking and scared, but then nothing happens. And there's this ebb and flow, I, I, I guess, to your inner chemistry somehow, where you become acclimatized to that sort of trauma and recurring trauma and recurring stress, constant stress, I should say, that you get used to. You get numb to it. You don't get the shakes anymore. You could drive up to these scenes of just carnage and terror and you light a cigarette and look around and be like, oh, well, all right looks like a suicide bomber blow up a bunch of people. There was no emotional attachment to the things you were experiencing, even though the things you were experiencing were, were wrought with emotion, were filled with emotion. Once his first tour in Iraq was over, Joe returned to Germany, where the celebration began in earnest. Literally 100% of the time, if we were awake, we were drunk. Uh, especially my group of buddies. It was just ridiculous. We were going to these briefings drunk. We were going to these medical briefings, like, fully drunk. So it was pretty ridiculous. I don't remember a lot of it because of that. Uh, but that's what it was. We had a lot of steam we needed to blow off. We had a lot of aggression and anger and frustration that we just could not release from that deployment because of um, the fact that we didn't have an enemy to engage 99% of the time. So that was our release. We came home, we just drank and drank and just partied and just had a good time and just were thankful that we made it and that we made it out. There's no way to reintegrate. There's no way to really process what you're going through because there's no real support structure. You go down the road of PTSD and you risk being kicked out of the army or being sent you know, to a council and losing your security clearance. You know, there's, there's a lot of risk to that. Um, so you self-medicate. You take a lot of... Um, you drink a lot, or some people take a lot of meds, or just do whatever they got to do. By the time Joe got home, he knew he was different with his family. There's an incommunicability that comes with a combat deployment, a turning point for many combat veterans that is tied at least as much to their first post-combat experience as it is to the first time they take fire. Men and women go into combat zones and learn to make do, learn to deal with the ebb and flow, as Joe put it. 
but when the deployment is over, they are forever changed in a way that can be hard to put one's finger on. It would be wrong to say that they long for combat, but many of them end up missing it. It's as if they get used to channeling psychological energy toward the inevitable adrenaline rush of combat, but then don't have a way to unchannel it. When you're home and you can't shake the feeling of paranoia, people worry about you. When you can't shake it in a combat zone, it makes you an excellent soldier. Think of it this way. Once this new way of seeing the world is revealed, there's no way to unsee it. The best many can do is learn to redirect it. Everything you do has, has gravity and has meaning. And then you come back to a life that does not, you know, that is, that is filled with so many things that are superfluous, that have no meaning. You know, you want to be part of something meaningful. You want to do something meaningful. And you, you feel the most useful as a human being when you are deployed and doing your job. And you don't feel very useful when you come home. Uh, and you're around a bunch of stuff that isn't meaningful at all. It's useless, you know. So we want to go back and be part of that again. That's what I wanted. I wanted to go back and be part of that again and, and do another deployment. But Joe didn't head to Iraq. Instead, he found himself at Fort Bragg preparing to deploy to Afghanistan. He passed the year in the Paktika province on essentially the same mission he'd had in Iraq. Here, there were fewer IEDs, but there were more mortars. It wasn't the violence, though, or the danger he faced in Afghanistan that made him reconsider his decision to remain in the army. It was an overwhelming sense of pointlessness. He was training police in two separate countries, but his experience with them was the same. They didn't care, and they couldn't be relied upon, broadly speaking. More than that, though, Joe's original decision to join the military was rooted in an idealistic view of military service, and all around, his idealism had been fading. When he came home from Afghanistan, he decided to get out, or at least to begin the process. And I'm told that, uh, you know, you do five years, you have three years of IRR in active reserve. You would be out of the army and you could be doing your own thing. But if you're in active reserve, if they want to call you up and put you back into the army and deploy you, they can do that. And you can't do anything about it. So you can either do that three years of IRR or you can extend your contract for two years into the reserves and do two years in the reserves and then you would no longer have to do inactive reserve. So I elected to do that, extend, you know, extend my contract, do the reserves, do it for two years. And they said that, you know, in those two years, you wouldn't deploy. You know, you get a little piece of paper saying, hey, we won't deploy you. If your unit deploys, you don't have to deploy. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so I extend for two years um, and, uh, you know, I'm in the reserves. I go to a unit in Arizona um, because there's a school there. I want to go to school to like be a mechanic or something. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I just kind of flung myself into like being a civilian and looking for a career or a craft that I could do and decided I would like study mechanics or something like that. So I go out to this school and I have family out in Arizona and I've always liked Arizona. So I want to go out to Arizona and be around family. There were two things Joe hadn't counted on when he extended his contract. The first was how close he'd become with his new unit. Young guys were coming into the army and Joe took pleasure in helping them in their training. Remember, the Army still is transitioning from an MP Corps that was primarily a peacetime operation to a wartime one. The second thing that Joe didn't really consider was closely related. Because he was part of the team and a United States soldier, he owed his fellow soldiers something. He had an unspoken bond that he had to honor. So when word came down that the unit was being deployed to Iraq, there never was really any chance of Joe sending them along without him. There was some reflection, you know, I know how dangerous it is over there. This is Iraq, and the last time I remember Iraq, we were getting blown up a lot. So it's probably even more fucked up now. So do I really want to go and risk getting killed or getting horribly injured? You know, so that, that weighed on me a little bit, I would say, to be honest. You know, but I thought about why am I there anyway? You know, what? why did I join in the first place? And how much will I let down these guys if I sit this one out? You know, the fact that I am only among a very few, a small handful of people in this whole company that has any combat experience, how much of a disservice would that be to all of these guys if I sat this one out? It just wasn't right. So, you know, there's a little bit of reflection, but I mean, realistically, there's no real choice. You gotta go. The benefit of his experience. What would he have given to have someone tell him that eventually the shakes go away after your first IED attack? 
or even someone to have taken him through better control of his weapon from early on, or how to manage the turret or the thousand million other little things that are not only the difference between being efficient and competent, but also can be the difference between life and death. The most important thing for Joe to do, he thought, was to demonstrate to the other guys the best way to stay alive in Iraq. And the best way to stay alive was not to be a soft target. So you want to make yourself a hard target, you want to look mean, you want to look like you know what you're doing, and you want to be watching your sector. You know, don't hang out smoking and joking. Watch your sector, get your hand on your weapon if you're a gunner, um, and look, look in your area. Pay attention to what's going on around you. It could come from anywhere. Look in the windows, look on the rooftops, look down the alleyways. Look at the people milling about around you and around your truck. You know, what's normal and what's not normal. And you need to start seeing that. You need to feel the street. You need to feel the sector. And for example, you ride into a market, and any market day, all the doors are going to be open and people are going to be out and going about their daily business and doing what they need to do in that sector and in that market. And they do that every day. But one day you drive by and all the doors are closed and there's nobody around. Well, you're fucked. Something is about to happen. And at that time, the uh, tactics of the enemy to start an ambush were either a shape charge grenade, which uh, was Soviet design, which would cut through an up-armored Humvee and cut right into a Humvee and cut through the person who was in the way. Um, they were pretty brutal. Another way to start an ambush is with a sniper. Um, the sniper would choose a target, shoot that target, hopefully kill them, and then the rest of the ambush would start. You have to learn it through experience, and that's what I wanted to impart on these guys was like, listen, I don't know where we're going, I don't know what to expect, I don't have the answers, but I can tell you that you need to learn your shit and learn it really quick. Being under siege is part of a tour in Iraq. It is the thing that is hardest to get used to, but it also is the hardest thing to shake. Joe had wanted to come back mostly because he didn't want to leave his buddies hanging. But for many combat vets, there is also this sense of balance that combat provides and civilian life doesn't. There isn't so much a sense of control as a sense of belonging. Chaos brings with it a certain surrender, or better, a resignation. Soldiers are resigned to do their job and to take the appropriate steps to keep them and their fellow service members alive but they also understand how little they really can do. And they accept that. Joseph Alato took every step possible to make sure he and his men executed their jobs as efficiently and courageously as possible without taking any unnecessary risks. But being in Iraq, being in any combat zone, is a daily reminder that the risks are inherent and mitigation is as much to make you feel like you have control as it is to unstack the deck wherever you can. In the end, Joe learned there are no steps you can take once an unseen attacker has you in his sights. After a long day, lots of us appreciate how nice it is to be able to know you're going to go to sleep. But over the last few months with my Casper mattress, I start anticipating how good it's going to feel to lay down. Knowing how the mattress is going to feel when you lay down is a really specific and pleasant sensation. What's even better is not waking up and feeling as if someone were beating me in my sleep. It still is mind-boggling to realize how long my body hurt in the morning just because I didn't have a great mattress, and also how quickly those aches and pains dissipated. My sleep literally has improved every day since I started sleeping on a Casper mattress. You hear about Casper mattresses coming in a box, but it is truly amazing when you open the door and see this small box that contains, in my case, a queen-size mattress. I'm really happy with my middle-of-the-road mattress, the Casper, but they do have two other mattresses. The top-of-the-line mattress is called the Wave. The Wave features a patent-pending premium support system to mirror the natural shape of your body. Their other mattress, the Essential, has a streamlined design at a price that won't keep you up at night. You can check out all of the mattresses and prices at casper.com slash thisiswar. They're not very expensive at all, especially given that you don't have to schlep out to the mattress store, pretend to try one out, and then tie it to the roof of your car to get it home. Casper also offers a wide variety of other products, like pillows and sheets, to ensure an overall better night's sleep experience. These people take the entire process of getting a great night's sleep very seriously. Plus, all Casper mattresses are designed, developed, and assembled in the United States. I always was puzzled by the notion of Casper providing hassle-free returns if you're not completely satisfied. But I realized that, 
when you're looking for a bed and you try this one out, you're just not going to send it back. The point is, you can be sure of your purchase with Casper's 100-night risk-free sleep-on-it trial. Get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash thisiswar and using the code thisiswar at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. Joseph Alato was shot on a day like any other. Before he hit the ground, he both had a perfect understanding of what was going on with his unit and absolutely no clue what was happening to him. The MPs were visiting a local police force. It was a regular part of their duty. Although Joe expressed ambivalence about whether and how seriously the Iraqi police were taking and accepting their help, it wasn't really his business. As a sergeant, Joe was there to help them do their jobs. Whether they did it or not was not on him. His duty was to make their jobs easier. The problem was, 2007 was a terrible year if you were wearing a uniform in Iraq. It's hot as I recall, and it's daytime. Near midday, you know, the sun's really high in the sky. There's no clouds, of course, summer of Iraq. In Iraq, so it's hot. Big blue sky, and we leave the police station, and we're all dismounted, walking from the police station to our trucks who were on their way. They had circled up, you know, driving in a line towards us. They were still not there yet. They were off. So as you walk out of the police station, the trucks are driving up so we can hop in and go. So we're walking from the police station to the trucks. That's when the ambush started. And it is this kind of dumb luck you just can't prepare for. As the U.S. soldiers entered his range of fire, the sniper moved his sight from face to face, unseen. There is no explicit reason that he chose Joe, except that maybe he appeared to be the softest target. Maybe he was closest to the sniper's side of the street. Maybe he was set off from the others just enough to make it an easy shot. Maybe the sniper was shooting at somebody else. There's no way to tell, and really, it doesn't matter. It's the equivalent of having somebody run at you full speed and hit you in the chest with a sledgehammer. That's what it feels like. You're walking down the road one second and the next second, you're hit in the chest with a sledgehammer and you're on the ground. And I'm completely conscious and lucid for all of this. I, I see, smell, hear, feel everything that's going on around me. And I'm walking in the next instant, I'm looking up into the sky and I knew that something bad had happened. I knew that I was hit. And my first thoughts are that I'm dying. You know, I'm, I'm laying on the ground looking up into the sky and, and I'm dying, right? I feel like I'm dying. I feel like I've been shot. It felt like I was shot in the chest. So I have mere seconds left of life and I'm spending it looking up into the sky. So everything explodes around me. You know, everybody's shooting and screaming and yelling immediately after I hit the ground. They immediately do what they gotta do. They pull the trucks up. They um, shield us, those of us that are dismounted, with the trucks because uh, they know that I'm hit, but they don't know if I'm alive or dead. I'm moving around a little bit, but I can't really move. I'm, I'm kind of frozen. I'm in an incredible amount of pain, not to mention I'm expecting to be dead within a couple of seconds. Uh, but I manage to get up and move. I get to my feet. A uh, guy kind of pushes me towards the Humvee. And everybody's still shooting and screaming and yelling. And the guy uh, who pushed me into the Humvee looks over and uh, looks at my IBA, my body armor, and sees the blood is starting to spread all over. And he yells, fuck. Fuck, he shot in the neck. Holy fuck, he got shot in the neck. All right, we got to go. And that's when I kind of freak out. I'm like, oh, I'm shot in the neck, so I'm, I'm definitely dying. And I look down, and I distinctly remember looking down and um, seeing blood rapidly spread all over my uniform. I'm bleeding all over the place. I'm shot through the neck, obviously, so I'm bleeding. It's a hot day in the desert. There's an immense amount of gunfire as the MPs fight with an eye toward preventing the second blow of the ambush, which they expect directly. Look down. The blood doesn't move slowly. It moves rapidly, and when it's yours, it moves even more rapidly than you would have expected. You're wrapped in pain and fear and waiting to die as the truck drops into gear and you head out toward the base, bowing through the streets of Tikrit as if your life depends upon it which it very well may. I'm freaking out. You know, I don't know what to do. I don't know what, I don't know what's going on. I'm completely lucid and I'm conscious. I'm not hallucinating. I'm not losing consciousness, but I, I just, do I have five seconds? Do I have 30 seconds? When do I, when do I die? You know, is it now? Is, when does it happen? And I'm waiting for the lights to go out and it's, it democratizes your emotions. And, you know, it, it distills your life force distills everything into a concentrate. 
and everything you feel is is like at its full intensity, you know? Everything you feel is at its full intensity. So yes, pain and terror, regret and anger, resolution, but also hope and determination and a sense of duty to yourself, your guys, your job. There's nothing else I can compare it to. It's, it is literally dying. In that moment, you're dying. You feel like you're dying. Not maybe dying. You're actually dying, you know. You're going through that process. And it's a five or ten minute ride, and by that time, I kind of come to my senses and that I stop expecting death to happen, and I'm realizing that I'm not dying. I'm just in a lot of pain, and but I'm okay. Well, you know, as okay as one could be. And, the, you know, I'm helping at this point. I'm helping treat myself. I'm holding bandages onto my neck on the front while the doc works on the back. I'm holding bandages on the back while doc works on the front. So at this point, I'm a bit more interactive. I'm coughing up blood and stuff, and things aren't, aren't going so well. But I'm, I'm helping at this point. I have the sense to help. Sniper rounds are larger than regular rounds, and so carry a concussive force that can do an incredible amount of damage. The round went clean through Joe's neck with enough force to crack one of his ribs. Imagine it, having something pass through your neck with such force that your initial thought is you were hit someplace else. The shock from the round put Joe out of commission for a bit, but had little effect on the rest of the squad, which managed to get him up and out without taking any other casualties during the ambush. All of this rushed through Joe's mind as he snapped back to it in the truck. If he wasn't dying right this second, there was work to do. He had for months been talking to his team about being safe and careful, about not being a soft target, but most of all, about being ready for anything. Anything includes being shot in the neck by a sniper. And we pull up and they pull open my door and a bunch of guys are there ready to carry me. And they want to carry me into the hospital and I push them all back and I say, get away from me, I'm walking. Um, and I got out of the Humvee and I'm got all my stuff cut off of me and I'm got bandages on my neck and I got blood everywhere and I'm coughing up blood and but I hold my head up and I walk well most of the way anyway I uh I collapse a little bit outside of the hospital but if I made it most of the way they carried me a little ways I walked most of the way and and, and from what I recall I, I just wanted to show the strength and resolve I, I didn't want my guys to be scared I didn't want them to be scared I was thinking about them and thinking about how this might be affecting them you know seeing this happen their first combat engagement and, and there's this guy bleeding all over the place mortally wounded and it's the guy that they respected one of the guys who had the most experience in the whole unit was most combat season that's the first guy that gets wounded that's fucked up you know so i i was kind of worried for them joseph alato was shot through the neck two months into a year-long tour he received his purple heart after surgery and a few days later he was discharged they had fished the round out of his body armor and he hung it around his neck with his dog tags with the exception of the hole in his neck and his cracked rib, Joe wasn't unfit for combat per se, but he was on the border. He also was ten months shy of getting out of the army for good. Had he applied pressure or even shown the disposition to, he might have been sent home. But as he said, he got in the army to do stuff. I had bandages on my neck and I was bleeding out of the bandages and I was in the gym, on the elliptical, on the treadmill doing sit-ups, just doing something. I was back at it immediately. And the leadership told me, you know, that that had such an effect on these younger guys. They saw, like, a guy they respected, a guy who was experienced, get hit, get hit bad very seriously and just get up and keep running and keep moving. And I can't go home. You know, I can't go home after that. I, if, if these guys are going to look to me, if they're going to trust me and if they're if my behavior after getting wounded is going to affect them positively, I have a duty to stay. I have a duty to stay and finish this deployment. And there's 10 months left on this deployment, you know. So I'm going to stay. So I stayed. But staying didn't just mean not going home. It meant proceeding as if you didn't have firsthand knowledge that no preparation or attitude with which you carried yourself had any effect on whether or not a sniper would choose you. Staying didn't mean overcoming fear. It meant projecting confidence outside the wire. And so, just a few weeks after an Iraqi sniper failed to kill him, Joe put on his now-damaged body armor and headed back out on patrol. I was a wreck. <laughs> I 
holy fuck. And not only that, not only am I a wreck, but I have to pretend like I'm not, you know, because I'm, I'm still a sergeant. I'm still leading guys, so I can't just walk around shaking and crying all day. <laughs> <laughs> I have to I have to look like everything's okay, right? So not only not only is the rest of the deployment difficult because I know what it feels like to get shot, but you know that it could happen again at any moment. Any instant, any instant, something could come for you out of nowhere. Um and having that in the back of your mind 24/7 is a lot of stress and definitely weighs on you. Uh so long story short, going back out on mission is pretty terrifying. I'm absolutely terrified going out on mission and I am for probably most of the deployment. But the added challenge is that I can't look like I'm scared because I'm leading people still. People are still looking up to me. And I still have a mission to do. Let's not forget. I still have a job. So it's tough, but it doesn't look like it's tough from the outside. But it was quite tough for me for a while. Joe's deployment ended without incident. Without incident is a relative term when you're talking to a combat vet. IEDs that don't wound anyone don't count as incidents to them any more than does thunder. When Joe went home, he saw his family for the first time in two years. He hadn't been honest with them, leading them to believe he wasn't on a combat tour. Their first notification of this was when they were informed that he was shot. The ten months they waited easily were as long for them as they were for Joe. But Joe wasn't comfortable at home. In fact, he was pointedly uncomfortable. So he packed his bags, scraped up what money he had, and left to backpack around the world. What he hadn't counted on, though, was that the trip held more for him than mere adventure. And when it got really interesting was I flew from Morocco to Egypt and flew to Cairo, and I found myself surrounded by all of the stimuli that I knew when I was a soldier, you know? Everything around me looked just like when I was walking on patrol or in a Humvee on patrol, in places where I was in combat. All of the stimuli around me told me that I was in danger. But I wasn't. I was a backpacker. I was just a traveler in, in Cairo and in Egypt, and I wanted to see the pyramids. I told myself in Cairo, either you get over all of this stuff that's going on with you right now and enjoy your trip and travel and go wherever you can go, or you leave Cairo and you never go back to the Middle East again. Right? Those are your two options. You get over all your shit, and you move forward, and you do the tra travel you want to do, and, and you have the experiences you want to have, or you get out. So I was in Cairo for a week or two, just fighting through all of it. It was slow going at first. Joe went from hiding from snipers he knew he was conjuring in his head to backpacking throughout the Muslim world. He had worried, after his first deployment, that his experiences had damaged him forever. But they didn't. They just changed him, and he knew that it was his responsibility to direct that change. And to direct the way it affected him, the way it affected his life, and his attitude toward the rest of the world. <laughs>